Our first speaker is landscape architect Jane Anderson Curtis, director of horticulture for the Herman Park Conservancy. Jane Curtis came to Houston as an associate of Laurie Olins to work on the first phase master plan for Herman Park. Since moving to Houston, she has served as curator of gardens at the Bayou Bin Collection of the Museum of Fine Arts, a member of the board of directors of the Herman Park Conservancy, and then its president. As director of horticulture, she is now on the staff of the Herman Park Conservancy. Jane. Since I'm kicking off the panel and we've already gotten some good history from Charles, I just want to make sure we have time to talk about how bad Herman Park got before it started to get better. Houston's park system and Herman Park began together. The first board of car parks commissioners was created in 1910 and George Herman was a member of that board. He was a thrifty bachelor who'd made his money in timber and oil. Herman had made it known that he planned to leave 285 acres to the city for a park, so the city fathers had a chance to publicly thank him, seen with the magnificent floral proscenium on the right. And soon thereafter, the commission appointed landscape architect Arthur Comey of Boston to develop an overall city parks plan. I know we'll hear more about the Comey plan later this morning, but it clearly identified Herman's tract as the largest piece in the proposed park system. It's in the southwest corner of the city, across from Rice Institute on Main Street. Comey referred to it as Pines Park, and the photo on the left was actually taken by Arthur Comey in 1913 and included in his report showing a majestic stand of pine trees. And as a side note here, Houston was founded in 1836 and its first cash crop was timber. So loblolly and splash pines form the predominant second growth forest. Herman had a chance to collaborate briefly with the city engineer, John Maxey, who was hired to do the initial design. So from its inception, we've had the roots of a public-private collaboration underpinning Herman Park. I'm showing this plan with its curving drives and recreation fields really as a foil to what came next when J.S. Cullinan, the founder of Texaco, lobbied for landscape architect George Kessler, whom he'd hired to redesign the neighborhood right across the street, Shadyside, to replace Maxey. Only this one piece of Kessler's 1916 plan for Herman Park survives. The central move, of course, was the extension of the Montrose Boulevard as an axis, which echoed the ceremonial and diagonal entry into Rice University off of Main Street. Along the central axis were most of the main park features, Sunken Garden at the entry, Grand Boulevard, Monumental Circle, the Reflection Pool, the Grand Basin, and a Science Museum. There were alleys on both sides of Main Street, public access with the trolley that entered the park at Fannin and jogged over to the uh, parallel main. And not seen in this drawing, there was a connection with Herman Hospital on adjacent land also designated by Herman in his will. So if you look at the city map of 1917, you can see Kessler's full vision, the essential framework of the park with looping carriage drives, circling athletic fields, and a golf course. The civic role of Herman Park was clear from the very beginning. It was a destination, accessible by private carriage or from the public trolley. It housed cultural institutions, it offered passive and active recreation, and a landscape of healing as the front yard for Herman Hospital. The development of Herman Park was consistently slowed by world events, first World War I, after which a more substantial phase of construction began, including the layout of the roads, the construction of Miller Memorial Theater, the initial construction of the golf course, and the excavation of the reflection pool. Now, Kessler passed away in 1923, and Hare and Hare of Kansas City inherited most of his work. To the credit of the Houston Parks Commission, Herbert Hare stayed active in Herman Park until 1962, which was 40 years. So initially, Hare and Hare had been working on specific areas in the park, like the zoo. In this 1926 aerial, looking north up Montrose, you can see that he chose to extend the Montrose axis, Kessler's axis, as a means to organize the zoo grounds as well, and to twin the park reflection pool with the smaller reflection pool inside the zoo you can still see today, also flanked by rows of oak trees. Then in 1930, the firm issued an update to the overall park plan that carefully referenced Kessler's original design. The park was at its largest iteration at this juncture, with an additional 130 acres to the southwest that was later sold back to form the Texas Medical Center. New features in this expanded vision included a Japanese garden, a rose garden with a conservatory, a botanic garden, a playground, and recreation fields. Construction slowed with the Great Depression, but it didn't stop. A number of features consistent with that 1930 vision were completed prior to World War II. Again, war brought another halt to park improvements, and it wasn't until the mid-1950s that interest resurfaced. Charles just told us that Houston grow, grew because of the freeways, but really, Houston's post-war growth accelerated with the invention of air conditioning. 
which we're all very grateful for. <laughs> on the positive side, the golf course was desegregated in 1954, making it one of the first in the nation. On the not so positive side, Bray's Bayou was channelized in 1956 by the Army Corps of Engineers, along with bayous all over Houston, with the notable exception of Buffalo Bayou. The new Miller Outdoor Theater, which is now the largest free outdoor theater in the country, and a new Museum of Natural Science were added in the 1960s. But by this time, coincident with the death of Herbert Hare in 1962, most activity and interest in the park was limited to these institutions, the zoo, the theater, the museum, and the golf course. Their growth and the growing number of visitors and their cars began to drive all the planning decisions. By 1962, a city-led study resulted in the removal of cars from the carriage drives and the addition of more paved parking in the very center of the park by the zoo entry. So of the 455 total acres of Herman Park, approximately 100 acres of parkland were effectively severed from use by roads or by the bayou, 125 acres were devoted to the golf course, 55 acres to the zoo, 10 acres to Miller Theater, 5 acres to the museum, and over 30 acres to paved parking in the center. The park was shabby and fragmented, despite its enormous popularity and continual use. Separate Friends groups merged in 1991 to form the Friends of Herman Park, and this upstart group collaborated with the more established Rice Design Alliance to sponsor a competition to redesign the heart of the park. And this was the turning point, not the winning scheme seen here, but the realization that one fantastic problem at the core would not solve the park's many problems. I hope you can appreciate by this point that the notion of stepping back and doing a master plan in Houston was a very rare thing, a city with an impatient attitude towards its own growth. Lori Olin was selected in 1993 to undertake the master plan. For those of you who know Lori, you can appreciate that he was a very good fit. He projected his enormous experience as a practitioner, as a world traveler, and a connoisseur of urban living. And this fit well with something I would hear repeated over and over by Houstonians in those early days of master plan meetings, that Houston needed to be seen as a world-class city. And the fact that the city signed and backed the initial development agreement to create the first green public-private partnership was a testament to Lori's influence and to Mayor Bob Lanier's faith in his vision. Lori emphasized a greater sense of mission by pointing out that due to the roads, the traffic, the parking lots, and the fenced enclaves, less than 90 acres was usable. He told us that the park had been loved to death. He drew this angry little diagram on the left. <laughs> and I say that because I was sitting next to him when he drew it, and he was really angry. Um, just to illustrate all of the dumb decisions that had been made over the past 50 years. And in his vision plan on the right, he was advocating for a park that was greener and bluer, an urban sanctuary, and a magical place alive with wonder and mystery. Then he articulated 10 key projects that would go the furthest towards restoring the integrity of Kessler's vision of 1916. Lori wrote that the vision of Herman Park aligns with a desire for equity and justice, for beauty, and for the delight in each other's company. These should be the joys of urban life. This is the role for the urban park. There were four essential principles to the 1995 Olin Plan, and I'm going to illustrate those points with the Conservancy's major projects and a few before and after photographs spanning the last 15 years. First and main principle was to restore the historic armature of the park. So this is a before and after of the heart of the park, which included McGovern Lake, the Reflection Pond, and the Sam Houston Circle. On the left, you see some images of the lake prior to the expansion. It was almost entirely surrounded by concrete or fence or both. The lake was doubled in size. All the concrete and fenced edges went away. We established habitat islands, softened the edges, introduced a robust pallet of planting, and a lot more seating and places to just relax and enjoy the views across the water. It was hard for me to choose which was the worst image in our archives, so I decided to go ahead and use them all. <laughs> Not only is this what I saw when I first came here in 1995, but this is the memory that people have quite fondly from their youth. Anybody over the age of 25 in Houston has very fond memories of going to Herman Park and feeding the ducks, but this is what they saw when they got to the very center. So Scott Slaney, who was a member of the winning competition uh, team, was then at SWA, so SWA developed that competition scheme. Lori kind of acted as the design godfather, and he tweaked the proportions, he restored and doubled the alleys flanking the pool, and made the most of some very subtle grade changes at the edge. 
It took 12 years of planning to finish the heart of the park, and by this point, the public-private partnership was beginning to take shape as well. One comment by the ASLA jury that awarded the 2005 General Award for Design Excellence was that the heart of park represents the best of civic-mindedness and philanthropy for which Houston is acclaimed. So this project finally began to give shape, to give form to something that people in Houston had known all along, as Sheila referred to. It was a tangible, elegant expression of generosity, of openness, of grandeur. There was finally a built expression of what being a world-class city meant. Quickly, a second principle of the uh, master plan was to improve access and circulation. We were still stuck with 30 acres of paved parking in the center. Uh, but this is a number of projects which all work toward that same goal. Uh, in 2002, we were able to pair North and South McGregor, reclaim the parkland at the center, and as you see in the upper left, reclaim the old carriage drive loops for joggers and walkers. In 2008, on the lower uh, left there, Laurie had this notion of prying apart the front and back nine to create a pedestrian access from the center of the park over to the east side. Those structures are there to keep you from getting hit in the head by a golf ball. <laughs> And then on the right in 2012, we finally achieved a major step towards reconnecting to the Bayou Parkland side of the park, both by putting underpasses under McGregor and a beautiful new bike bridge named for one of our founding board members, Bill Coates. And now that we've got B-Cycle in Houston, the kiosk in Herman Park is the most visited kiosk in the city. The third principle was to improve life in the park by addressing basic visitor services. So as I just said, we still had 30 acres of parking in the very center of the park. Uh, acknowledging that as the main entry experience for most visitors is what led us to this sort of multi-dimensional project to acknowledge, uh, to improve the Lake Plaza. Up in the upper left, you can see it was just a, a very vacuous and open, hot space with that fenced edge on the lake. So the, the um, once again, inspired by the reflection pool, we ended up with tilted lawns facing toward the lake, lots of seat walls, lots of shade. That's what the little train looked like. <laughs> That's where you would buy your tickets. Another very fond memory that most people who grew up in Houston have is riding the miniature train. But by this time, the Herman Park Conservancy had taken over this concession and the pedal boats. The new Kinder train station here has a gift shop, restrooms, we're operating a cafe. And another part of this project was reactivating this silted-in drainage ditch as a vegetated swale that could manage storm and water runoff from both the lake plaza and the lake. The fourth and last principle of the master plan was to improve and provide long-term stewardship. So the Conservancy's been working for years on habitat reforestation, restoration throughout the park. But a nice microcosm of our story is what's been going on with the Japanese garden restoration. This was one of those fenced enclaves that Lori had driven all the angry lines through as a place that you couldn't even get into. It was added to the park in 1992, and it took a number of years. It became very rapidly less Japanese, so it took a, a long series of years to advocate to get the Japanese-American community re-engaged to not just adopt the garden, but to figure out what the best way was to move forward. And we finally consulted with a Japanese landscape architect and a Japanese master pruner who started coming in 2006 and have been coming every year since to help train uh, parks and recreation staff and pruning techniques. And then ultimately Mr. Nakai has made design recommendations for adding new gates, uh, new elements, and has really improved the garden. So this is a great example of the evolution of our public-private partnership where you know, we are, we're working with park maintenance staff, with volunteers, and these experts coming in from out of town. So I'm gonna pause here and just talk a little bit about the partnership itself. I think it's fair to say in 1993 that the Friends of Herman Park had been very much inspired by the Central Park Conservancy, who had at that point been operating for about 10 years in Central Park, and who had made much more immediate inroads into the maintenance piece. This was the model to which they inspired, but the early days of the partnership were much more tentative. For starters, it was extremely difficult to get major gifts into park redevelopment or restoration, and it was even harder to convince donors that there needed to be a set aside for a maintenance endowment. But building the organization that could fix the park was as hard as raising the money. It's taken years to grow into what we are today, a model public-private partnership for parks groups all over Houston. There were some bumps in the road. We rewrote our mission in 2004 and completely turned away from educational programming and developing educational programs in order to dramatically expand our volunteer activities and try to close the gap between what the park needed from a day-to-day -day maintenance point of view and what the city was able to provide. 
with our most recent centennial projects, we've taken a huge leap forward in becoming an organization that is really weighted towards stewardship, visitor services, some of which are revenue producing and maintenance operations. And through this, we've continued to craft and evolve our partnership with the Houston Parks and Recreation Department. This is in an era, and I think we'll hear more about this too, when the maintenance of flagship parks is getting rapidly privatized. So personally, I have a great appreciation for Joe Turner sitting right here in front of me, who's our director of parks, who really does understand operations, and for Chris Carroll, who's the superintendent of maintenance for Herman Park, who provides us with a lot of support and access to resources. So the Centennial Gardens, this is the crowning achievement in honor of the Park Centennial in 2014. We worked with Harris Schott, Landscape Architects of Chicago, and White Oak Studio was the local landscape architect. We ended up, after a big, uh, slow period during the recession, when everything ground to a halt, uh, we picked it back up and ended up with a scheme that very much references Ozart's past, but is rooted in the present. Um, we selected Peter Boland, Boland Sawinski Jackson to design the pavilion and even from the interview phase Peter was talking about the building as gateway, how it would, the walls would peel away and the roof would lift and it would all be about this entry sequence and seeing this self-consciously composed view of the enormously crazy thing that we built in the back of the garden which was the 35 foot tall garden mount which as Doreen Stoller, my boss, likes to say appeared at about 98 percent DD. And um, <laughs> when things are pretty well cooked and all of a sudden this thing landed out of the sky. But I, I'm, I, I tell you, it's so successful. It is just the most marvelous thing. And it's, it's almost like watching the internal workings of a clock on a busy day because there are people going up and people going down. And it's just this fantastic, fantastic event. The main lawn is surrounded by a series of eight garden rooms, each with a horticultural theme. We've brought in a much higher level of horticultural richness here without trying to do it all. This was always intended to be a pleasure garden, not a miniature botanic garden with collections. And we're working on educational partnerships now with nearby museums and with Texas AgriLife. Once again, we've taken on a long-term maintenance commitment here. The Herman Park Conservancy is actually contracted by the city of Houston to maintain and operate this eight acre piece of the park in full. And we will welcome you all this evening for the reception in the Flores Pavilion. So I want to end by going back to Lori's words about equity and justice, about beauty, and the delight in each other's company. I think collectively these projects have fostered changing patterns of use in Herman Park. It's still a destination, but it's more episodic. We have daily visitors who really treat the park like their home. It's begun to feel to me much more personal and private. It's an enormous park in a very dense city, but you can't have an experience that feels protected and safe. I find people asleep in McGovern Centennial Gardens all day long. It's a wonderful thing to see. We've gradually introduced new vocabularies of what's acceptable in terms of planting. We have areas that are wilder, looser, much more naturalistic, as well as this garden, which has this unabashed horticultural richness. And I think connectivity has been achieved by reconnecting people with a natural experience, by drawing people not to the institutions, but to the park landscape itself, allowing them that transformative moment of calm in what is now the nation's third largest city. So I've tried to set the stage for the next series of projects this morning, and if we're discussing measures of success and how we can judge that, I think we need to look beyond what's been successfully executed in Herman Park over the last 20 years and appreciate the degree to which this one park restoration has become the catalyst for other work in Houston. Existing park renovations, completely new urban spaces, the long, long overdue effort to finally implement Arthur Comey's plan to reactivate the Bayou Corridors, and dream projects like the proposed Houston Botanic Garden.